In the wake of the September 11th attacks, the National Counterterrorism Center was created to identify and stop terror threats to the U.S. Christine Abizaid is the director of the center. Christy, welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. You know, as I just said, the NCTC was created in the wake of the September 11th attacks. The 9-11 Commission said about those attacks that they were, quote, a shock, but they should not have come as a surprise. Mm -hmm. All that information was there. It just wasn't all together in the right place. Mm -hmm. How does the, the center address that problem? Well, we do it in a number of ways. The most important is that we serve as a place across the United States government to fuse all source intelligence, both intelligence on the foreign side, the domestic side. We have analysts and, and um, assignees from across the interagency that all sit there and use their expertise from across their different agency experiences to understand all the terrorism information in the United States government's holdings and to understand where the threats might be coming from. So what are you doing to make sure that that intelligence gets to the right place, doesn't fall through the cracks, and that all the dots are connected before an attack? I mean, that's fundamentally our mandate, right? Um, understanding all source intelligence, looking both up and down the chain of acquisition, digging into different operational elements, engaging with our counterparts across the intelligence community. We have to have a broad view uh, and insight across the world on what our terrorist adversaries are doing. And so being able to do that and being able to engage and broker uh, across the interagency the right conversations about what the intelligence is telling us and what the strategic trend lines need to be responded to, that's really key for us at the National Counterterrorism Center. So what makes the National Counterterrorism Center fundamentally different from all the other intel uh, agencies around the federal government that are also analyzing that data and um, trying to understand it? Well, first of all, we're the one place that all that data comes together. We have unique access across the federal government into various aspects of the counterterrorism challenge. But also, we're the one place where all the different agencies come and sit to do analysis together. We have analysts from CIA, we have analysts from DHS, we have ODNI cadre that are part of the National Counterterrorism Center. You can swivel your desk and have an interagency conversation just by sitting at the counter National Counterterrorism Center and looking at the kind of information we're dealing in. So um, we are also have a very important independent role. We don't have an operational arm at the National Counterterrorism Center. We have a very objective view about all the information that's coming into us. And so it gives us a, an ability to have sort of a unique insight into the strategic value of all the information that's coming into U.S. government holdings. Counterterrorism is no longer the driving force of American national security. So how has the Counterterrorism Center pivoted in response to that change? So first of all, I think it's great credit to the counterterrorism community that counterterrorism is no longer the driving force of our national security. Um, I, I, you know, credit the work that has happened over the last two decades after 9-11 from this very diverse, very integrated and collaborative community that has allowed us to deal with a threat that, you know, I would characterize as less acute in the homeland than at any time since 9-11. And so as we in the National Counterterrorism Center look to evolve, still create that foundational sense of security for Americans so that we're defending against our terrorist adversaries, we also are trying to do it in the most efficient and effective way possible. And so when you look at a model like the National Counterterrorism Center, where all different elements of the federal government come together to do work in a collaborative fashion, there are efficiencies and optimizations that happen along the way. And I think we're actually better positioned now than probably at any time since our founding to fulfill the mandate of being that singularly focused organization that can provide that foundational support on counterterrorism while the rest of the government can go and do other very important national security issues. So how would you say the foreign terrorism threats have changed over the past 20 years? It's interesting, you know, um, you look at how Al-Qaeda on 9-11 was a very uh, hierarchically managed, centrally located organization in one part of the world. Um, we've seen it diffuse over the last 21 years, in, in part, in large part, because of the significant counterterrorism pressure we were able to bring to bear in Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, and then other places where the threat uh, evolved to. Now, the diffusion has made it, I think, a less 
urgent and acute threat to the homeland here. It's made it more difficult for them to hierarchically manage uh, attack planning. But it's also created new challenges and new complexities for us in the counterterrorism community as you see spawns of Al Qaeda like ISIS emerge in Iraq and Syria, different branches uh, spreading out in parts of Africa. And that diffusion creates a vast amount of territory that we need to cover as an intelligence community to understand where that next threat is coming from. So then how are you innovating? How are you adapting to address those changes? So first and foremost, Technology has to be part of my job. Technology modernization is critical for us to look across, again, those vast holdings of the United States government and enable us to, in an automated way, discover threats and then dig into whether those threats present an urgent challenge to us here in the homeland. And so there is a fair amount of machine learning, artificial intelligence, automation, big data analysis, that all has to come together if we're gonna be the unique center that holds the unique value of counterterrorism information for the United States government, we've gotta find a way to do it more effectively, more efficiently. Technology is a key role. Technology modernization is essential for us. Christy, now that US troops have pulled out from Afghanistan, has that crippled our ability to see and collect uh, intelligence information? I mean, objectively, we are not going to have the same intelligence footprint in Afghanistan as we did before the fall of Kabul. That's absolutely true. I think it's been acknowledged across the intelligence community and intelligence community leadership. I wouldn't call us crippled. Uh, we are a very effective intelligence organization across the, the United States government, bringing all uh, elements of our national power to bear in uh, being able to collect the kind of information we need to understand strategic threats. So um, I don't think we're blind in Afghanistan, but we are certainly less well positioned from an intelligence collection perspective than we had been when we had significant boots on the ground. You know, an example of U.S. intelligence success was the death of Al Qaeda's leader, Ayman al-Zawahri. Uh, what are you able to tell us about why that operation was so successful? So. I mean, there were so many things that uh, I just really credit a, that collaborative CT enterprise for having been able to get to the point where we could identify Zawahiri's location and take a strike that, uh, that took only him out, avoided all collateral damage, and really, uh, for, my, for my part, eliminated a strategic and symbolic threat that was essential. Uh, to protect the country. You know, you look at the role that Zawahiri was playing in the years that he led Al-Qaeda, he was an important strategic figure for the group after Osama bin Laden's death, he, even before that. And the kind of strategic direction he was providing to this diverse and diffuse network that I described before was important for the kind of prioritization that that network has had against the United States. So you feel like that organization has fundamentally changed because of his death? I think it's different. Um, you know, the affiliate structure that he led is still pretty resilient, actually. You've got Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al Qaeda elements that are in the Sahel and North Africa. You've got Al Qaeda elements that are in Iraq and East Africa. Those elements are still very much present and present a challenge to us as the United States government. But the ties that bind them that were really resonant in uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri's leadership, I think that is weakened after his removal from the battlefield. And you think Al-Qaeda and ISIS still pose a threat to the United States? I do, absolutely. Um, you know, we are constantly monitoring uh, across the intelligence community for where the threats might be coming from. And Al-Qaeda and ISIS remain the main challenge for us from a counterterrorism perspective as we look across the international landscape. Part of your mission is to understand the causes of um, Islamic or extremist violence, let me say. Mm -hmm. What's the answer? What's the solution? Well, it's interesting. It, it very much depends in so many ways on the local environment and the local conditions. You know, I talk about this affiliate structure and the diffusion of the Al Qaeda and ISIS networks across the world. That diffusion has been enabled by different underlying conditions that exist in these different locales. So what is driving the Al Qaeda expansion in Mali, for instance, is gonna be very different than what has happened in Yemen. But understanding that at a level uh, that is not just about counterterrorism, counter 
but is about fundamental governance issues, corruption, the ability of you know, governments to provide for their people, those are always essential components for whether a terrorist organization can thrive. What's the center's role in combating domestic extremism? So we play a supporting role to the lead organizations for the United States government in this space, which is the FBI, DOJ, and the Department of Homeland Security. Now, you know, I've described NCTC as having a very important domestic and foreign intelligence mission that fuses all that so we do not become stovepiped and we can see the totality of the threat that's focused here in the homeland. That does come into play when we talk about domestic violent extremism. Um, but it doesn't put us as the primary organization focused on that. We support our um, lead federal agencies in, in that respect, and we try and do so in a way that focuses especially on the transnational aspects of the challenge, um, which, you know, is resonant most in the aspect of the challenge that focuses on racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism. You also work on the, at the state and local level. Explain that. How do you do that? So we do that in support, again, of FBI and DHS. Uh, those are their key interlocutors. But you know, one of the key foundings of NCTC was that we are able to disseminate terrorism information that's in the United States government's holdings to those that need it. When you think about where a terrorist attack is most likely to happen, who the first responders are that are going to need the information to deal with that, or those that could be the most effective at preventing it, state and locals are the key to protecting the homeland, protecting our communities. So we want to make sure we're getting information to them as part of our key role of disseminating the U.S. government's holdings in a way that enables them to be better postured against the threat. When you're looking at your, your mission as a whole, do you work with tech companies? Do you work with social media platforms in tracking terrorists and, and their online activities? So in general, private sector outreach, I think, is an important part of enabling that information sharing mandate that we have at NCTC. And yes, tech company outreach is an important factor here, especially because if you look at the way that terrorist organizations communicate, how they organize today less physically and more um, in a virtual and online way, the kind of information that we have about how those adversaries are exploiting today's technology environment is important. And so we do engage in information sharing from that perspective. And just really quickly, what's the biggest threat to the United States, terrorism threat? So Al Qaeda and ISIS remain intent on attacking the United States. I think we've done a really good job as the United States government in making ourselves a harder target over the last 20 years. Um, but we have to keep our eye on the ball. And so we're going to stay focused on those terrorist threats, even as we see these evolving challenges here domestically in the homeland, uh, dealing with lone actors and otherwise. Uh, but we cannot let the terrorist threat evolve in ways that go faster than the United States government can keep up with. And so we're here to make sure that doesn't happen. Christy, thanks so much for being on the program, and, and thanks for your work over at NCTC. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.